Welcome to the Afropolitan Podcast, hosted by Eche Emole, founder of Afropolitan. On the show, we chat with Afropolitans whose footprints form the foundation of systems dedicated to building the future of a bold and progressive Black community. In each episode, our guests share their working formulas, the hard facts about leaving familiar terrain, embracing the unknown, and staying relevant afterwards. Listen as we extract the blueprints of fearlessness, innovation, and progress. Hey, Afropolitans. In today's episode, we chat with Daniel Yu, founder and CEO of Wasoko, a technology company that is transforming the $600 billion market for essential goods sold through mom and pop stores in Africa. Wasoko provides on-demand ordering delivery and financing services to these small retailers. Daniel talks to us about his journey with Wasoko and the importance of digital technology and services to solve Africa's supply chain problems. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Daniel, thank you for the time. We just it's just conversational. Okay. Yeah. So the mic or whatever. Yeah, yeah, the mic is just right here so okay, you can cool. hear it. But I'm just these my these are the questions that I have. I think I already explained to you the goal of the podcast, which is like we want to be able to tell these stories, preserve them. And it's not just even for the audience of today, but for the audience of the future. I think with African tradition, we've always been oral tradition heavy. And we feel like podcasting is a new oral tradition, right? But this time we get to actually pass down these stories and they don't die when people die and it does, it gets lost within the sands of time. But Daniel, let's dig into your story, right? A lot of entrepreneurs in your position don't, necessarily head to Africa, right? What was the decision behind Africa and how did your life experiences prepare you for that? Why Africa as a, as a beachhead to go to? Great question. Mm -hmm. I'm originally from California, yeah, but I grew up in a multicultural family. Mm -hmm. uh, my father is uh, originally from China. Okay. And uh, I would say that I always had that global perspective as a result, you know, I've got family in a few different places, and, yeah. you know, knew that the, the world was bigger than the, the suburb that I grew up in. Yeah. And when I was in university, actually, I had the, the opportunity to study abroad in Egypt. Mm -hmm. uh, I was learning Arabic of all things at the time. And while I was there, I got to know some of the small shopkeepers in the neighborhood right. where I was staying. And uh, that's where I kind of first came across this challenge of for a small shopkeeper restocking the goods uh, that they need for their shop, the rice, soap, toilet paper, what have you, is actually a whole big journey and initiative and, and wastes a lot of time, adds a lot of cost to their doing business. And uh, my background is also as a software developer. And so I kind of naturally uh, approach this problem with that tech mindset and realize that, hey, um, I should be able to build out even just a basic platform that uh, could be able to address this issue. As the founder and CEO of Wasoko, you've been working to transform commerce in Africa. Can you tell us more about Wasoko and the problem it aims to solve? Yes, so what Wasoko does is it allows small mom and pop shopkeepers, like the ones that uh, were in my neighborhood in mm -hmm. Egypt, mm -hmm. to be able to order through our app for the rice, soap, toilet paper, what have you, and get those goods then delivered to their shop same day, free of charge. Uh, and that allows them to continue trading without having to shut down the store for half a day to go downtown, to the central market, mm -hmm. all of that exactly. And um, uh, they're able to uh, therefore keep serving their community uh, without interruption. Uh, on the, the back end, we're working directly with the manufacturers of all these goods. Um, uh, some of them are multinational companies like Unilever, Procter & Gamble, uh, but the majority of them are actually local or regional manufacturers that are making the goods. Um, and we're uh, sourcing from them in bulk, uh, given we have 50,000 of these mom and pop stores that we now work with uh, across a number of countries. And uh, that allows us to get the best deals possible and actually offer the, the products at the same, if not lower prices uh, than what the shopkeepers would be getting, even if they went themselves yeah. uh, to, to town. So what does Wasoko's monetization model then look like? Are you then monetizing through the manufacturers? Because you're saying that the mom and pop stars get it for free. So where is the 
monetization model, when does it kick in? Yes. So we're, we're able to actually uh, make a margin mm-hmm. on the sourcing price that yeah. we're able to get by negotiating with the manufacturers in bulk and what the kind of normal market price yeah. uh, that the shopkeepers are paying. Yeah, that's great. What, what were some of the challenges initially? Because, I mean, I feel like I tweeted the other day, like, Nigeria will test whatever business model that you have in mind, but I feel like it probably applies to different African markets. What were some of the assumptions you had of this commerce model and what did the market tell you differently? We definitely had uh, a lot of challenges in the early days. I would say the the most significant one was even our initial go-to-market strategy. As I mentioned, my background is as a software developer and my original thought on the the solution that would be sufficient here would be to just have a pure software platform. Yeah. So my, my thinking was, okay, uh, I'll develop the app, the, the basic ordering yeah. uh, system. And then when the shop places the order, you know, there'll be a backend portal mm-hmm. that the suppliers can see. Yeah. Uh, but then, exactly. But then all of the delivery, all of that, they, they'll be able to handle that themselves. Uh, turns out that uh, when we actually, you know, went to market and, and started uh, piling this, that just having the, the software, the tech alone was, was not enough. Um, and so we, we had to uh, then uh, pivot or, or expand our model um, to also include our own in-house logistics. And it was only once we started doing that ourselves, which of course was a whole ordeal and, and, yeah. and, and, and adventure that uh, we started to really see the pickup because we were able to guarantee the reliability of our service. Quality assurance. Uh, exactly, exactly. So um, that, that was definitely a big learning for us. In that I think a lot of startups eventually just realized that you have to vertically integrate in Africa to ensure um, a lot of the things you're actually choosing to deliver. And it, it's very, um, it's very interesting um, way of building compared to like you can be in California and some of these other things are taken care of and all you just have to do is worry about the pure software play. Completely. I, I would say that the, the whole approach to building uh, in, in the ecosystem is different because the ecosystem is fundamentally at a much earlier stage. Yeah. Whereas, uh, you know, in California, if if you're building a tech solution, you're you're in an existing environment where all of the core problems have already been solved for the most part. So, yeah. so really what you're doing with whatever your new product is, 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 is almost always just incrementally improving uh, uh, on something that already exists. Yeah. Right? If, it, if you start a, uh, an ad tech business that has you know, half a percent higher click-through rates, that could very easily be a billion dollar company because yeah. you know, the click-through ad market in the US is so yeah. big. Yeah. But you know, in the African context, you are building entire verticals of products and services from scratch yourself. And yeah. because there aren't third-party logistics products, there is no UPS or FedEx that you can just plug into as an e-commerce company reliably on the ground yeah. uh, to be able to supply tens of thousands of mom and pop stores. Yeah. Um, that's why we had to build that ourselves. Bicycle operates in several African countries, right? Um, and I know maybe you're planning on expanding into Nigeria. What was the thought process of... Because usually the, the thought process is like, go to Nigeria first. It's one of the biggest market. What was the thought process behind starting in the countries you started in? And what have been some of the cultural differences that have come to play in each of these countries? Good question. Yeah. And uh, I would say perhaps I have a, a bit of a contrarian view <laughs> on, the, on, on the Nigeria go-to-market strategy. But to, to answer the, the, the latter part, uh, the reason we started in Kenya yeah. as our first uh, country of operations is because... We got the invitation actually from a number of manufacturers uh, in their Kenya offices. Okay. So this is going back to 2015, 2016. Yeah. And um, we had the invitation to uh, initially pilot and launch our, our systems there. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think uh, that had a lot to do with the existing prevalence of M-Pesa. Okay. So the idea that uh, already you know, the vast majority of people are sending uh, mobile, mobile money, money yeah. you know, just through SMS, USSD, you know, the idea of doing something similar to order products for a shop, uh, you know, seemed, I think, natural to the manufacturers that are based there as well. So that's how we got going in Kenya. And then since then, we've expanded uh, to, to five countries, mostly in the East African uh, region. And that, that has largely been because if you look at the manufacturer networks, you might have a manufacturer who has a factory in Kenya making soap, but then they're exporting those products to Uganda, to Rwanda, 
uh, Tanzania East African as blood. well. Yeah, and and so we found that it's actually been uh, quite straightforward uh, to expand those partnerships uh, with the same suppliers to cover additional geographies nearby as well. In the early days, what did it look like for customer onboarding? Was it you and a team literally in the markets, like onboarding folks and also the manufacturers as well, going to their offices, having conversation? Is that was that like? Yeah, I mean, the, the, <laughs> the, the initial days, uh, you know, we were working out of a emptied out two bedroom apartment okay. uh, in a, a kind of a, a low income neighborhood, mm-hmm. kind of right on the edge of uh uh, you know, where uh, we had our initial kind of uh, customer pilot neighborhood and you'd have messages coming in. Back then, we were still primarily uh, using SMS as the ordering method. So you'd have uh, an order come in for two boxes of soap and we would have uh, delivery agents literally on foot with backpacks that would take a box of soap from the corner of the room, just- put it in and then go run and deliver it. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it, our, our first warehouse is also an apartment not much bigger than where we're sitting right now. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's how we got started. Man, it's like, I feel like a lot of people get to see the shiny output of it. But that initial like grind of, hey, the two bedroom apartment, this is what you have to go do to get the soap. Even though you have the technology, it doesn't solve for that, I guess, the hardware piece of actually having to go do that. Completely, yeah. There's, there's no substitute, you know, for uh, you know, actually just getting the early operations off the ground. Uh, if you're waiting for some state of the art warehouse or something like that, you know, your your, I mean, certainly in, in our experience, you know, we would we never would have made it there because yeah. when we got started, um, there was nobody who would write a you know two million dollar check uh, off. Uh, a concept note or off an idea. We had to actually show the numbers and, and demonstrate that there was Correction. a real market in what we're doing. And, you know, the way that we did that was by, you know, running sales out of a two bedroom apartment uh, until and, and getting, you know, I, I think if I'm not mistaken, we got, uh, uh, you know, $50,000 a month plus of sales going out of that apartment um, before, you know, we then got additional angel checks that allowed us to upgrade to a, uh, a house that we had, uh, we just brought in a container and we used that as our warehouse. For, yeah, we just we just kept kind of iterating up the scale from there. Oh my lord! So let's talk background, right? What did you study in terms of educational background, and how did that help inform what the work you're doing today? Yes, yeah, so I have an interesting uh, uh, educational history mm. in the sense that I mentioned I'm I'm a software developer, but yeah. I actually did not study computer science in school. Uh, I actually didn't even finish uh, university. Yeah. Uh, I dropped out um, after uh, after two years. Where did you go? Uh, I went to the University of Chicago. Okay. And uh, while I was there, I uh, studied Arabic, uh, international studies, uh, and uh, and a bit of economics. Okay. Uh, but uh, finished none of them, <laughs> as I said. So <laughs> so I uh, dropped all those things to go uh, be a be a tech entrepreneur in Africa. So so you're self taught. Not self-taught, but you didn't go to school for computer science. So you basically had to go learn about it, whether, whether it's you went to another program, but you you learned how to code. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So, so I actually I started off, uh, you know, self-taught uh, uh, with uh, a number of kind of basic things, more kind of front end technology, like HTML, CSS. Yeah. Um, and then uh, uh, later on, I actually did do one of the kind of boot camps to learn kind of full stack engineering as well. So that kind of stuff. Um, and then, you know, I had those skills once uh, I was kind of leaving school and, uh, and going off uh, to do things uh, in, uh, in Africa. It's amazing. How do you see the future of commerce and supply chains evolving in Africa? And what role do you envision what's good playing it in the future? Great question. I would say that the core technologies themselves, obviously, we're seeing a lot of very powerful developments with... Um, Things like AI, I think obviously there's a lot of excitement around Web3 and, and we are seeing the impact there, uh, both, both of those fields. Um, I, I, what, I, what I'd still caution, and I think this kind of goes to my whole history with Wasoko Company, is there, there's still no substitute for the on-ground operations. In our case, the logistics, you, know, you still have to have a space for the physical goods uh, to be stored, to move around, trucks still need to go shop to shop. 
And of course, all of that is underpinned, is managed by technology. Yeah. Um, but it, it's not fundamentally substitutable by technology. And, and I think that's where, you know, maybe a lot of these technologies, as they get hyped and uh, released uh, and, and talked about in the context of their transformative impact or potential in Africa, where, where things kind of break down a little bit, um, you know, how, how do you actually, you know, make a, a Web3 currency work in practice for uh, a trader in the market yeah. or, you know, one of our mom and pop stores? I mean, the number of times that I've been approached by someone on the Web3 side who's looking to integrate with us to do something interesting, uh, you know, they're, 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 they're always fascinating in terms of what the potential is. But how do we actually practically bring this to market for that average trader? You know, that, that's often where the gap is. And yeah. in, in our case, you know, we had to bridge that gap by doing the logistics ourselves, doing the, doing the traditional stuff ourselves yeah. to actually show that an e-commerce driven approach to be stocking your store yeah. uh, is, is a better value proposition than, than you going yourself yeah. and getting everything. Uh, and I think the same thing needs to be done uh, to, to bring these other technologies to market as well. Would you say that there was a role for word of mouth, like where a retailer or a mom and pop is like, hey, I've been using one so good to stock up my stores. And then they can tell their their friends or other people who own stores. Did you see have you seen some of those stories as well? We've seen a bit of that. Yeah. But honestly, the, the vast majority of our customer acquisition has been uh, direct onboarding by agents that we manage and have going shop to shop. Shop to shop. shop. Wow. Yes. Okay. Jeez. As an entrepreneur, how do you approach risk taking and decision making, especially in uncertain or rapidly changing environments? And what are the most important qualities or skills that an entrepreneur should possess in order to succeed in today's competitive business landscape, especially in Africa? I think the best framework that I've heard for taking risk and decision making is when it's a reversible decision, then move quickly, try things out and, uh, uh, you know, learn rapidly through, through iteration. When the decisions are irreversible, then tread much more carefully. Yeah. Think, think slow, act fast, yeah. I think is, is, is what you want to do there. Um, so, you know, it all depends on the given situation. The good thing I'd say is that the vast majority of decisions that you do face day to day as a startup founder are reversible. You try something this week, doesn't work. Okay, try something different next week. Yeah. Uh, relatively few things that, that kind of fall into that latter category. But I think recognizing the differences between them uh, and then adjusting uh, your pace of planning and, and execution uh, is, is important. Are there any books that have had a profound impact in your life or the books that helped build up the mental models and mental frameworks that you, you approach life with? You can just mention three. Great question. Mm. I would say Doing Good Better. Uh, it's a fantastic book by a uh, professor at Oxford, uh, Will McCaskill, um, uh, that just kind of breaks down, uh, you know, I'm someone who's, uh, you know, I'm not in this to uh, make money, uh, to, to kind of maximize my net worth. I think if, if, uh, if I want to make money, I would have had a much better probability of doing so, just staying back in California. Yes, you would, a, you would have. As, as manager. So, you know, the fact that I've made it this far, uh, I think yeah. this is more down to chance rather than, than anything else. Um, but yeah, so, so, so to me, I think that, that kind of opportunity uh, to, to think about, you know, really what is impact and, and, and what is it to actually uh, make the world a better place? You know, I think doing good better uh, is, is a fantastic, uh, you know, deep dive into that. Um, Another book that's, uh, you know, maybe more uh, uh, directly uh, related to the entrepreneur's journey is uh, Shoe Dog by Phil Knight, uh, the, the founder of Nike. Yeah. Uh, fantastic, fantastic book. Uh, you know, talk about uh, kind of like crazy ups and downs uh, in, uh, in, in kind of new markets. Uh, you know, that guy, when he was starting off uh, ever 50, 60 years ago, uh, he... Uh, had all sorts of issues, you know, crazy investors that, you know, try to bankrupt the business and, uh, you know, trying to set up supply chains to manufacture shoes uh, in Asia for the first time and bring them over, all, all sorts of crazy stuff. And, uh, and then the, uh, uh, the final book that uh, I'd point to that, that's been highly influential uh, to me as well uh, is uh, Mountains Beyond Mountains, okay. uh, which is a biography of uh, uh, a doctor, a physician by the name of Paul Farmer, uh, who actually just passed away 
uh, last year, I believe. And uh, he, uh, you know, dedicated his life towards uh, really developing uh, and, and, and improving the level of, of healthcare uh, in, in the global south and kind of bringing that to, uh, uh, you know, kind of wider audiences and, and you know, the opportunities and inequalities mm. uh, that exist. Um, so I think that that's also uh, something uh, that uh, very uh, inspiring to me. When it, when it comes to talent and recruiting talent, right, I'm sure you've seen a vast, um, you've had a vast experience in either recruiting folks to join Wasoko or even having to let some folks go. What advice would you give to entrepreneurs in terms of hiring talent, or especially in markets like Africa, where for some parts, the talent might not be as highly skilled as the way you were used to in places like California, right? What, what have been some of the challenges that you've had with that and how have you addressed it? Yes, I think... Uh... You know the the state of the talent ecosystem is, you know, roughly uh, reflects uh, you know the rest of the ecosystem as well, which is you know we're still in the early phases, yeah. and so you don't have the same veteran talent uh, from a, a tech uh, operations perspective that you would have if we were uh, building up a, a similar business in uh, Silicon Valley or even in you know India mm. for for that matter. Uh, simply because you don't have those generations of Compounded. successful, yeah. exited unicorn companies um, that that have uh, people that have been there and done it before. Um, so I think that the way I would say, certainly for myself personally, when I approach how do I uh, upskill myself uh, to understanding how to deal with this situation, looking at the parallels, uh, yes, with Silicon Valley and scaled companies there, but I would say more effectively with other companies in other emerging markets. Um, so I, I've spent a lot of time and built a lot of contacts in India, um, also in Southeast Asia uh, and a bit in Latin America as well. And there you do have ecosystems where they have had, um, uh, in the case of India, you know, they've had successful exits uh, going back, uh, you know, 15 plus years now. And you have companies like Flipkart that, uh, you know, went public uh, nearly 10 years ago and, and you know, have, have become uh, uh, worth hundreds of billions of dollars. And, and that's an example where you can learn from uh, what they've done, how they've done it in a similar, um, you know, kind of uh, lower resource environment yeah. uh, and, and apply all those practices. In some cases, um, uh, recruit that talent directly. Uh, we've had success uh, with that kind of bringing in, uh, you know, e-commerce experts uh, from some of those companies and, and, and kind of uh, uh, bring it in the market. And then, you know, uh, as part of that, also kind of pairing with them, uh, you know, very kind of bright, young, hungry, uh, you know, local talent as well, so that you kind of get the best of both worlds in terms of upskilling uh, the team. But yeah, I'd say there's, there's, there's no, uh, no silver bullet on that side. You know, there's no substitute for experience. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you have to get that experience from somewhere regardless. You have worked in different industries, including finance, healthcare, and technology, right? How do you approach the process of identifying new opportunities and deciding which ventures to pursue or even invest in? Good question. I would say that I am a very curious person. So constantly learning, uh, looking to understand different fields, different opportunities. At the same time, I think that I've also become better at understanding uh, what I do know and what I don't know. Yeah. Um, and I think this is very key, especially, uh, you know, as I, as I start to dip my own toes into uh, doing a bit of angel investing myself, um, I've, I've only gotten involved with um, a few companies so far, but I've certainly had many more approach me. And I think, you know, my, my general criteria or my approach, at least, at least for now, given that I do have, you know, limited time uh, to, to, to be doing this outside learning mm -hmm. Uh, is to basically stick with with what I know and what I'm good at. Yeah. So I think where I'm at right now, I uh, feel that I have a, a very strong understanding of the dynamics around consumer goods and logistics in Africa. Yeah, and uh, I think there's there's a lot that can be done there. And if you look at the few that I've got involved with, um, uh, and, and actually kind of put money behind, uh, they've largely been okay. Makes sense. If there was a book about your life, what would the title of the book be? <laughs> Oh boy! Uh, I, I hope nobody is uh, writing books or uh, thinking about it. I'm, I'm certainly not. Uh, hopefully, I still have a lot more of life to go. Yes. Um, but I would say 
something along the lines of uh, of every day is an adventure. Something something <laughs> like that. Adventure. Because I'm, I I don't know. It, it's just it's amazing to me, and and and, and truly, I, I feel this every day, and, mm. and and I hope to still have this feeling for a long time to come. That I I, I am kind of truly blessed and fortunate to. Uh, have had the range of experiences that I've had to have gone the places that I've gone um, and to still be experiencing and, and, and encountering uh, so many new places and people yeah. is something that I'm, I'm continually grateful for. Um, and so, yeah, hopefully, hopefully still a lot more of that to come and, uh, and uh, hopefully no books uh, <laughs> in my future anytime soon. Before, before, before that, yes, no, definitely. What would you say is your perspective as we round up? What would you say is your perspective about what it means to be Afropolitan? I would say that the, the spirit of Afropolitan and why I'm, I'm so excited about uh, the community that's being built is to connect you know, one of the most powerful forces in the world, which is, which is human communities, yeah. um, to the fastest growing place yeah. in the world, which is the, the, the African continent. Um, and to, 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 to leverage those forces and kind of decouple them from the, the actual kind of physical space itself because um, uh, obviously the opportunity to, to pull in uh, the diaspora, um, uh, other people who are affiliated, who, who have the same kind of beliefs about the potential and, and the growth of the continent, uh, I, I think that's, that's, that's extremely powerful and, and also necessary mm -hmm. given that a lot of the institutions, certainly the governments, uh, if you look at them in uh, many of the individual 54 countries are not uh, doing uh, as much as they could uh, to unlock the potential yeah. of uh, the continent citizens themselves. So I think building these alternate institutions and communities that can really help empower and bring those resources uh, to the continent uh, is, uh, is, is absolutely needed. Thank you so much, Daniel. Thank you for giving us the time. I hope you've had a great time at the Under Afropolitan podcast. Looking forward to having this chat with you again and maybe this time in Zanzibar. Sounds great. <laughs> Thank you so much, Daniel. Have a great one. Thank you for listening to the Afropolitan Podcast. We are building the future of a progressive Black community. To join our community, you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Afropolitan. Be sure to join our Discord and Clubhouse community by clicking on the link tree on our Instagram page. See you on social.